Um, hi, hi everyone. Welcome to my presentation, um, answering the question, who was Leo Africanus? Sorry, I couldn't work out how to get my face in it. Like, I couldn't, that was just too much. I couldn't do that. So you're just going to be able to hear my voice. Lucky you. So, who was Leo Africanus? Let's find out. Um, Leo Africanus was born in around 1494, and he was born Al-Hassan ibn Muhammad Awazan al-Fasi in Granada, Spain. And he was born a Muslim. He moved to Fez at a young age because of Granada being, con take, being taken control of by Catholic forces in Spain, with all Muslims in the Andalusian area given three years to leave. He became, along with his family, a refugee and settled in Fez, Morocco, where he had a privileged upbringing. Leo's father was Muslim, but one reference in the Arabic encyclopedia says his mother was Jewish and converted to Islam before marriage. We're unsure of the truth of this, but it has an obvious potential impact on Leo's ability to adapt and assimilate into the different cultures and societies he lived in during his life, as we'll soon see. So this is what is thought to be the only sort of surviving portrait of Leo Africanus. It's debatable whether this is Leo or if it's um, another sort of person. It's, it could be Leo or it could be this other person, I can't remember his name, in Italy at the same time. Um, but it's useful if you want to put a, a face to a name. So Leo's identity was from an early age liminal, situated between two locations, and this liminality only continues throughout his life. Leo describes his disparate identity through an allegorical story of an amphibious bird. God gave this bird the ability to live both in the sky and the seas, and when he's asked to pay taxes in the sky, the bird goes and lives in the sea, and when he fears injustice in the sea, he goes back to live with the birds in the sky. A human being, according to Leo, is like the bird and seeks whatever serves his interests. This story becomes particularly relevant as you learn more about Leo's life. Sorry about this slide, I tried to um, I tried to make something cool but it got a bit cut off at the bottom, but I hope you can see what I meant. Um, Leo studied at the University of al Karouin. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, um, which is considered to be the world's oldest inst institution of higher education, in Mor and it's in Morocco. He then worked, you know, while studying as a scribe at an infirmary for sick foreign travellers for two years, which was... Um, a, a period that gave him exposure to a number of foreign experiences. Leo's uncle was a diplomat for the Sultan of Morocco and would sometimes take Leo on his missions around Morocco and, Bar and beyond. It's on these journeys that Leo began to build up a geographical index of North Africa. By the early 16th century, European explorers had a good knowledge of the coastal regions of Africa. It was Leo's travels and later document later documentation beyond Morocco, however, into the heart of Africa that changed the way Le Europe looked at Africa. In the early 1500s, Leo travelled to Egypt, Libya, Turkey and the Arabian Peninsula. It was Leo's description of Timbuktu that most captured the imagination of European emperors and travellers. Leo visited twice in 1510 and 1513. On, the fir on his first visit, he was a companion to his uncle, and on the second, his purpose was, we think, it's believed, just more personal, um, rather than being attached to any sort of official diplomatic mission. Um, Leo's later documentation of Timbuktu led to a European race to get a white Christian man into the centre of gold that Leo had described, and it's just one example of the impact of his writing on the relationship between Europe and Africa. So, going back to his life, as you can see, in the summer of 1518, Leo was captured by Spanish privateers looking for plunder and slaves. Unransomed Muslim captives would have almost always become slaves in Europe, but because of his intelligence and importance, which was recognised by um, those that had captured him, Leo was taken to Rome and presented to Pope Leo X as a gift from the privateers that had captured him. Pope Leo recognised the importance of having someone with such knowledge of the geography and culture of the land of the Ottoman Empire, which was the Roman Empire's biggest enemy. Um, Leo's usefulness in Rome was not only to do with war. There was a large scholarly community interested in learning Arabic, and Leo taught them and translated many Christian books into Arabic. By 1520, the Pope had personally baptised Leo and converted him to Christianity, giving him a new Christian name that was modelled after his own. You know, Leo Africanus comes from Pope Leo X. Later in Leo's life, however, he had made it known that he was never really a Christian. It was just for pragmatic reasons. There is an, um, an, an Islamic religious term that describes the 
pragmatism of a Muslim having to conceal his or her faith for their own survival. I can't remember the um the term right now, but um, Leo also always signed his works with both with both his Christian name and his former Muslim name. So it's evident that he never renounced um his former uh life pre moving to um well being taken to Italy. His relationship with the Pope gave, gave him the freedom in Rome to write um, Description of Africa, which is an English translation of the Italian name, um, and also teach the community of Italian scholars he surrounded himself with about the Arabic world. His, teach, his teaching was an explosion of learning for those he taught, shining light on a culture that was, for the most part, completely unknown of. He completed Description of Africa in 1526, it's believed, and the work was published in Italian first, in 1550 by a, by a Venetian publisher, later in French and Latin, and then in English, translated by John Pori and printed in 1600. The book was not published in Arabic until 1992. Um, there are multiple theories about how Leo spent his later life. Some say he remained in Rome until his death in 1559. Others say, others say he left his, sorry, not 1559, 1550. Um, there's another theory that says he left Italy right before the um, sack of Rome in 1527, heading for Tunisia, and then remained there until his death. And another says he actually left Tunisia in 1535 because of its capture by Charles V, returning to Morocco to spend the rest of his life. All of these theories come from different allusions and complicated sources, and so it's actually very unclear um, as to how Leo sort of spent the rest of his life following roughly the year 1526 when he finished um, Description of Africa. So, uh, description of Africa, or Descrizione dell'Africa, which, sorry, that was probably terrible in pronunciation. Um, so, yes, um, Af Leo Africanus's book provided the first detailed descriptions published in Europe of modern Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and the, ki and the kingdoms of West Central Africa. It's made up of nine books. The first is an introductory book. The next seven focus on seven different kingdoms. And the last book is an appendix an appendix on um, the rivers and the nature of the areas that Leo describes. It's so important as a text because it offered European scholars, explorers, map makers and monarchs detailed descriptions of the gold trading kingdoms of Central Africa. Not only was Leo's writing geographical, he recorded how people lived, how they ate, how they dressed, their economy, their habits, their cultural lives. This information was timely. The Latin Christian power of the Western Christian world was preoccupied with the threat of the Ottoman Empire, especially Pope Leo X, um, who was a particularly um, political pope in that sense. And the threat of the East was very prescient. So obviously having a um, someone like Leo with the knowledge that he brought through description of Africa and also just his teachings was so important for... Um, for the Roman Empire. This is a picture of the um, the uh, description of Africa. Um, it's as you can see, it's the um, the English translation. There it says translated and collected by John Pory of Gonville and Keys in Cambridge. How nice. Um, so the English translation. Um, just another point that sort of furthers the. Um, diplomatic importance of uh, this book. The English translation was printed and published in accordance with the visit of the Moroccan ambassador to London to negotiate a military alliance between English and African forces with the hope of conquering Spain. John Pori, um, the translator, as we've seen, explicitly references the convenient timing of his publication in his accompanying letter to Sir Robert Cecil, the secretary to Elizabeth I, which you can read um, if you look at this translation. It starts off with a letter to Robert Cecil, and then it starts off with um, John Pory's own sort of notes and his sort of introduction to the text. And yeah, we're just going to have a look at a couple quotes um, of John Pory's translation. So this one, um, so doth he most um, indically describe the temperature of the climate and the nature of the soil, as also the dispositions, manners, rights, customs, and most ancient pedigrees of the inhabitant inhabitants, together with the alterations of religion and estate, the conquests and overthrows of the remains, Goths and Arabians, and other things, by the way, right worthy, um, the observation. So that is um, 
how John Pori describes the importance of a uh, description of Africa as not only just a geographical record, but also as an insight into the lives of the people in these um, in these sort of kingdoms that Leo was documenting. Another quote um, really sort of stresses the importance um, of the text in John Pori's um, eyes. So I'll read this one out as well. Africans may justly lay to him, by him he means the Africaners, and the English to Master Camden, as the Prince of Roman orators did unto Marcus Varro, the learnedst of his nation. Wandering up and down like pilgrims in our own native soil, thy books have it, as it were, led us the right way home, that we might at length acknowledge both who and where we are. Thou hast revealed the antiquity of our nation, the order of times, the rights of our religion, our manner of government both in peace and war, Yet thou hast described the situations of countries and places. Um, so, one um, interesting sort of critical um, point in ter- uh, about the description of Africa and Leo Africanus himself is the relationship between Leo Africanus and Shakespeare, and whether the description of Africa was a source for Othello. Um, so it is John Pori's translation, obviously, that Shakespeare is suggested to have read and taken inspiration from for his depiction of Othello. Lewis, Louise Whitney writes on whether Shakespeare did know Leo Africanus for the Modern Language Association, um, which I'll cite in the handout if you want to read the whole thing, which is a really good read. It's quite quick as well. And um, in it, she described dis- um, description of Africa as the readiest, best known and most compendious source that Shakespeare could have turned to. Whilst obviously Shakespeare's use of the book can only be regarded as a possibility, Louise says it seems to be altogether too much of a possibility to be ignored. Whitney also remarks on the parallels between Othello's early career and that of Leo Africanus before he arrived in Italy, and on the more general depictions of the traits of character shared by the Moor, as described by Leo and Othello. And a little fun, like, random thing that I just found out, which... um, I'm sure you guys will love, because we all love Yeats. Um, in a short turn of events, Leo Africanus played a role in European literature um, through none other than William Yeats, who participated in seances over the summer of 1912, during which he started making contact with a spirit who called himself Leo. Two years later, this contact, the contact became closer, and the spirit identified itself as Leo Africanus and offered Yeats his insight and advice. If Yeats wrote to him, Leo would respond through Yeats' own hand. Yeats' own hand, and Yeats considered Leo his daemon, an alter ego, and a heroic ideal. Um, however, Leo's influence on Yeats sort of gradually wanes, and the contact ended finally by nineteen seventeen, which I just thought was such a random and hilarious sort of connection between our favorite author of first year and Leo Africanus. So, yep, that is Leo Africanus. That's who he is. That's why he's important for um, studying the early modern period. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Bye.